The Apollo Lunar Space Program is cemented in time for the scale of its ambition and accomplishments. But one of the greatest moments in NASA's history is nearly its worst. Astronauts Fred Hayes and Jack Swigert train alongside Apollo 13 Commander and veteran astronaut Jim Lovell for NASA's most ambitious mission yet. Apollo 13 really went to take a step further than the previous two Apollos that had been on the moon. They had landed in areas called mare, these sort of flat plains. So you only looked at the rocks that were right on the surface. And there's a lot of interest in what's happening down below the surface of those mare. So Apollo 13's aim was to go to an impact crater where some huge collision had happened with an asteroid. That impact had thrown material out and it dug it up from lower regions of the crust. And Apollo 13 was targeted to try and get to rocks that were characteristic of a different age of the moon compared to uh, Apollo 12. Apollo 13 launches to explore the moon and follow in the successful lunar footprints of Apollos 11 and 12. But just 56 hours into the mission, the spacecraft suffers a devastating malfunction. Apollo 13, Houston, we'd like it to stir up your cryo tanks. Okay, stand by. About 56 hours, all three of us heard a rather large bang. Just, just one bang. Okay, uh, right, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Stand by, they got a problem. We got more than a problem. Okay, listen, you guys. Fuel cells one and three are offline. All right, that's what we're reading. When an onboard oxygen tank ruptures, two of the spacecraft's three fuel cells begin bleeding precious power. We gotta get a pressure readout on that thing. O2 quantity number two is zero. That's the end right there. I, I can't believe that. The mood in mission control was immediately one of disbelief. I have absolutely no clue to what happened. Something happened to the fuel cells in the oxygen tank. And when I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down, it dawned on me and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time that we were indeed in serious trouble. And it looks to me that we are venting something out uh, in the space. It's a gas and some sort. Roger, we copy your venting. Not only is oxygen vital to keeping the crew alive, but the spacecraft's three fuel cells cannot generate power without it. It was quite apparent to me that it was just a question of time that the command module was going to be dead. We're still 70 to 80 hours away from the Earth. Without power, the spacecraft would shut down, communication systems would die, and the crew would be stranded in space. Within two hours, the third fuel cell had to be shut down. That's the only means of electrical power for everything needed to get the crew back to Earth alive. 200,000 miles from Earth and trapped in a dying spacecraft, the crew of Apollo 13 faces a life and death crisis. NASA has just one chance to bring their men safely home. We knew that the command module was gonna lose power. The only way to survive the situation was to transfer to the lunar module and we started going through procedures to get power on. The initial reaction was stabilization, to get the whole mission stable so that we could at least buy a bit of time. Assign people to study how we keep the crew alive and how we keep our options open. With its own independent life support, power and communication systems, the lunar module acts as a lifeboat but with a limited 45-hour lifespan intended for a two-man crew, NASA ground teams work around the clock to keep three men alive for the 90-hour flight back to Earth. The main difficulty that the astronauts had is they were losing power all the time, and they had to find a way of maintaining power for the whole duration of the flight. To support three men for three and a half days, the whole way in which it was operated had to change. To combat the astronauts' dwindling consumables, NASA instructs the crew to power down the lunar module, preserving the spacecraft's limited water and electrical supply. However, the crew suffers serious dehydration, and the temperature inside the lunar module plummets. 
It was a, sort of a chilling coldness. The walls were perspiring, the windows were completely wet, and it wasn't too healthy. I recall that it was like reaching into the freezer for the, for the food. There was ice forming on the inside of the windows. The crew were beginning to suffer under those appalling conditions. It was a dire state. It was a real, real emergency situation. Surviving on the minimal power reserves of the lunar module, the crew is further jeopardized by the carbon dioxide buildup on board the spacecraft. When you breathe oxygen, you exhale carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide, if you don't do anything about it, builds up in the sealed environment of the space capsule and becomes a poison. Lithium hydroxide canisters scrub the air supply of carbon dioxide. But with the command module powered down, the lunar module's scrubbing system is overworked, designed to just support two men for two days, not three men for four days. It wasn't possible to take the lithium hydroxide crystals from the command module and place them in the lunar module because the shapes were different. The command module canisters were square cross-section, and believe it or not, the ones in the LEM were round cross-section. This was a very serious problem. I mean, it, it could easily have been the end of the rescue mission had they not uh, solved it. NASA has mere hours to engineer a system that patches the square canisters into the lunar module life support system using only what the astronauts have available to them. Ground read us up a procedure in order to adapt some of the canisters, and as they read this thing up, Jim and I constructed one of these things. Cut a piece of tape this long, put it up there, do this, do that. It worked a treat, you know. Within an hour of switching it on, the carbon dioxide levels were way down, and they were through that really serious consumable problem. There were moments when I didn't know how much consumables we had, whether we could make it back or not, but in a situation like that, there's only one thing you can do. You just keep going, and uh, you just keep thinking up where you can get more consumables. And uh, so that's exactly what we did. It is without question that one of NASA's greatest triumphs during the Apollo 13 rescue was the way Mission Control successfully stretched out the dwindling life support consumables. Had those consumables not been monitored and economized as accurately, the mission and the crew would have been lost. In the entire history of human spaceflight dating back to 1961, Apollo 13 was the most dangerous episode in which the crew has successfully survived. And it's one all part of that streak uh, missile. All panelists blown out from the base to the uh, engine. Copy that. What happened in mission control and by the crew themselves showed that the NASA spirit at the time was absolutely up to the challenge, not only of getting human beings to the moon, but returning them to Earth safely when you've got multiple emergencies coming up that are threatening your crew's survival again and again and again. Extremely loud applause as Apollo 13 comes through loud and clear on the television display here. I regard Apollo 13 as an immensely impressive example of engineering. The systems engineering, the organizational engineering, was so solid, was so intelligent, was so well structured that when the accident happened, the organization was found totally capable of dealing with it. And I can't imagine why anybody would want to be anything other than an engineer. One of the most important points that can be made of this flight is the initiative that people have when suddenly faced with an unusual situation. I think it's, a, it's amazing the way that people can respond so fast to get this job done. The safe return of the Apollo 13 crew is a testament to the caliber and dedication of the engineers and astronauts of the Apollo Lunar Program and is universally regarded as NASA's finest hour.